Hi, doctor. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, doctor, are you able to share your slides from, uh, uh, yeah. uh, from there? Can you just try? Yes, yes. Just make me the host. I'm not able to do it otherwise. Okay. Okay, doctor. That I have given the access, you will be able to present now. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, fine. Thank you so much, Shine. Okay. okay, sir. Are we waiting for anybody from uh, Kabi Tales, uh, Shaheen? Yes, um, yes, yes, doctor. We are waiting for the staff. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. They're just joining in some time.
hello, good morning. Hi, Dr. Chetan, this is Nisha here. Hey, hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, just give us five minutes, Dr. Sure, really sorry, we had our parent orientation right now and there was this little spillover from no the parent discussion. They got carried away. So uh, just give us two minutes, yeah? Oh, sure, sure, no worries. Thanks, thanks. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, me. everyone. Yeah, hi. hi, hello, Dr. Shetan. How are you? Yeah, yeah, all well. Surviving the waves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think all of us are. <laughs> Uh, Shasta and Sahana, if you can just confirm all your uh, parents who've uh, confirmed uh, have joined. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so. mm. mm. Yes, Expecting uh, some more parents, ma'am. Okay. I can start. Doctor, what do you I say? We can start yeah. in a minute or so with the introduction and then the others can join as and when they have the credentials.
Hi Nisha, good morning. Shaheen this side. Hi Shaheen, good morning. Hi. So uh, can we start or should we wait another two, three minutes or so? I think uh, just one minute and then maybe we can start because there are a few more parents who were supposed to. We had the orientation today. There was a slight spillover. So uh, yes. sure, sure. Okay. just one more minute and maybe we can start then. No issue. Sure. Okay. I think we can start. Uh, we can start. Okay, we'll start. I yes. will be sharing the recorded video with you later, which can be circulated sure. among the parents. Sure. Okay, good morning, all. Good morning, teachers and parents. I warmly welcome all of you to our today's session on safeguarding children from COVID. And with us, we have Dr. Chetan, lead consultant, pediatric, pediatric intensivist, Dr. Sagar Bhattar, doc, uh, consultant, pediatric immunology and rheumatology, Dr. Srikanta Jeti, pediatric interventional pulmonology and sleep medicine. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chetan. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning, uh, Team Cubby Tales and all the parents uh, of, of Cubby Tales as such. And if any children are watching, good morning to you as well. So, uh, so what we will do now is, is basically uh, go through a set of basic slides just to, to give you an orientation about COVID in children. And because there is a huge speculation uh, of, of about the third wave, uh, what is the exact reality? What are the myths associated with it? And are we going to do something differently in, in coming times? Or should we follow the same norms? Because the, the situations are changing, the virus is changing. Does it put children at more risk? These are the kind of doubts which are, uh, which are um, in parents' minds and they would like to ask us. So, so maybe first 20, 25 minutes, we will go through a series of slides highlighting what is the current status of COVID in, uh, in India as of now. Uh, we will look at how is it affecting children. We will also look at the post-COVID complications, which again is in the media in terms of MISC, the black fungus that you have heard about, and also the uh, status of vaccines. When is it going to be available for children? What is the current science and, and uh, economics behind it? So I'm joined by uh, Dr. Sagar, who is a pediatric immunologist who, who uh, is um, collecting, collating, and advising on the post-COVID MISC and Dr. Srikanta, who is a pediatric interventional pulmonologist at ASTA, and who also um, um, is, is one of the members of the Karnataka State Government Task Force for, uh, uh, for taking care of children with COVID. So with that introduction, uh, I, I would like to start sharing my slide and, uh, and then go through it. So good morning once again. So uh, what we are going to discuss is, is uh, I've already highlighted uh, basic COVID uh, myths and facts. Is the second wave affecting children more than uh, it should? And what is the uh, what does the data show? What are the preventive measures in um, uh, about COVID? How are you as parents coping up with COVID? And uh, what are the ways that you need to uh, look after children? Because it is not only a, a kind of a medical, physical issue, but it is also having a lot of bearing on children who are unable to go out, meet their peers, interact with other children. So there are a lot of emotional as well as mental issues that these children are facing. And also they are reflecting your anxiety as well, because as parents who are bombarded with the kind of um, news media that, that's into our houses, 
we are definitely anxious and and some of it is spilling over to our children as well and third way what is the exact current um, uh, recommendation in terms of what have been the acad uh, academic bodies being saying we look at what are the recommendations from the indian academy of pediatrics what does it say about the third wave what is the preparedness that we need to have and how do we go about it so let's jump into this uh, facts and myths as you all know covid 19 started somewhere in november 19 in china became a worldwide pandemic in march 2020 and then it has gone on to have multiple waves the second wave in india was more of a tsunami and then it is primarily a respiratory infection which starts off from affecting the upper respiratory tract uh, as such which includes the nose mouth throat and then it gets the virus gets endocytosed or or picked up by the cells and then migrates into the rest of the body system especially affecting the lungs most of the cases in adults were mild and and almost 15 to 20 percent needed hospitalization however in children the affected numbers were significantly smaller in in the first wave because the net amount of people affected were again very very small however more large number of children affected uh, got affected during the second wave so there are two basic scientific reasons for that one is that the virus mutated to to uh, to make it more infective uh, as such so large number of adults were affected and just by the number of adults they were affected the percentage of children affected uh, also though it remained same it, the net number of children who got affected was significantly higher what as clinicians we saw in the first wave where we were seeing individual family members getting affected but in the second wave we are seeing the whole families getting affected in a very short period of time highlighting the fact that the second wave and the mutated virus which was there is definitely more infective spreads very fast and affects everyone as such added to that the the current uh, science which tells us that the infection is not only a droplet infection which spreads by the respiratory droplets of cough sneeze talking but also it is an airborne infection uh, thereby uh, more recommendations are coming in with respect to having a good cross ventilation and natural sunlight Uh, in our uh, houses and workplaces the fact uh, for children is that children can occasionally become serious with covid the need for hospitalization however is still less than 2% that means if 100 children get affected with covid or become infected with covid the hospitalized children will be less than 2% children can spread covid to parents and grandparents that is that is the the, the worry which was um, plaguing a lot of parents at this time saying that uh, i have elderly parents uh, at home uh, some of the families had vaccinated them some of them had not and children being children they 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 were interacting with the grandparents and and gra grandparents were sometimes primary caretakers of these children now if we as adult parents carry the infection back home and then give it to our children and then these children are interacting with their grandparents does it put my grandparents at risk um as such this this was a major question which came about and uh, yes the children can be super spreaders and they can carry the infection because younger children especially we cannot make them wear masks we cannot make them follow covid appropriate behavior because they do not understand the significance of that in most cases however in children the illness is mild and they are asymptomatic so most of them as such will have a simple cold cough coryza and fever and uh, they they which will last for one or two days and then it will go away so they don't require any long term um, monitoring as well as um, uh, incidence of hospitalization also in children is significantly much much lesser however the 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 university of whatsapp is full of these myths which which add on to the confusion as to what to follow and what not to follow and in a pandemic uh, scenario when uh, when fake news really really has has taken over our lives a lot of these myths were propagated uh, as such without any scientific basis some of the examples are steam inhalation can prevent covid those steam inhalation is known to loosen the mucus and makes it easy for you to breathe by moisturizing the airway excessive use of steam actually causes more damage to the, the to the inner lining of our nose mouth and throat and can be detrimental uh, for for uh, for uh, covid as such immune boosters all of our uh, kind of uh, facebook or our social media 
our the mainstream media and wherever we log in everywhere there are ads about immune boosters as such so if the, if the immune boosters were so potent um, mankind would not have faced so many diseases as such and the reason uh, these immune boosters were were there in in um, in limelight is primarily because of economic reasons and no specific immune boosters have have really really made uh, uh, mankind kind of uh, immune to the covid infection as such the basic immunity hinges on principles of good nutrition and uh, home based diet exercise and physical activity as such immune boosters really really do not have any role in preventing covid also there was a lot of talk about alternative forms of therapy as such most of them are again hinged on general wellness but none of them have got any specific benefit against covid so this these are the myths we need to know and we need to kind of uh, be aware of before before uh, understanding about covid so if you look at the the uh, whole uh, whole conundrum of immune boosters so the covid-19 online search for immunity boosts the top list of queries by especially indian users because india is a huge market and these products have been pushed into all your social media handles and and uh, it's being searched for what other uh, uh, things which came to fore uh, in the last one year of kind of constant uh, learning uh, unlearning relearning is that whatever drugs which were initially uh, kind of propagated as a possible uh, cure for covid or a prevention of covid have not found to have much use they include hydroxychloroquine ivermectin doxycycline azithromycin multivitamins as such all of them had hypothetical benefit based on certain scientific principles but uh, now we have enough data and patient base with whom we can confidently tell that most of these therapies are not very very useful so children with covid again uh, to reiterate the fact it, it causes very mild illness in majority of them simple cold and cough the covid wave uh, the second wave of which we have seen a lot more children being hospitalized and cases with covid pneumonia just because the viral load was very high and the adult population was significantly affected the mutated virus was definitely much more infective in nature so we saw a lot of children with covid pneumonia but more importantly what we are seeing right now is something known as a post covid kawasaki disease or multi system inflammatory syndrome uh, associated with children now this is is uh, what is affecting children more significantly and bringing more children to icu than the covid infection and the covid pneumonia per se so what is this post covid uh, misc it is basically that the immune system of the child gets triggered because of an exposure to covid infection and even after even after the child recovers from the covid infection and virus has is no longer existing in the body the immune system forgets to switch itself off and then there is a cascade which which self propagates and starts attacking the body itself so that is the that is manifest as an illness almost 4 to 6 weeks after a covid infection some of which we may not even know that the child has got exposed to covid but when they come to us they they come in very very sick with the following uh, symptoms which you are going to discuss now if your child turns covid positive one uh, humble request to all the parents is that do not panic it we are in the midst of a pandemic infection does not directly mean disease so exposure does not directly mean disease so infection most of the children as we uh, told were all mild asymptomatic children book a video consultation with your doctor doctor uh, plenty of fluids to continue paracetamol oral which will control the fever episodes <clears throat> avoid self medications especially when when uh, a lot of us translated the adult prescriptions onto children and families were actually self medicating that is extremely dangerous most of those medicines do not know how they react to a child's body most common among them is the role of steroids people were popping in thinking that steroids will help us against a severe covid infection but that has resulted in another pandemic of of the black fungus which is there in the hospitals now and it is predominantly because we were not careful with self medications 
monitor saturations using a simple pulse oximeter uh, twice a day. And if the saturations are more than 94% on room air, then you need not worry as such. Remember, majority get well. If your child is just having fever, if he's otherwise well, his energy levels are good, he's not having loss of appetite, not having breathlessness, maintaining saturation, then you need not worry. And you, you can monitor the child uh, and, and discuss the symptoms of the child online um, as such. The post-recovery of COVID, which Dr. Sagar also will allude to in, in, in the discussion uh, as such, the multisystem inflammatory disease, it is seen in almost 0.5% uh, percent of children who recover from acute COVID infection. So if 200 children had COVID, one of them will land up with this complication, but it is a severe complication and uh, it, it needs some uh, close monitoring and most of the times ICU care. So how does it present? The multisystem inflammatory syndrome presents with very classical symptoms, predictable symptoms. If brought in early, it has got a very predictable course. And if treated early, it has got a very predictable recovery. So with that in mind, make sure that any one of your children or family members have got exposed to a COVID positive patient even if you have not tested the child for COVID, remember that the timelines is two months after the COVID uh, infection or exposure. If you see these symptoms in a child, which includes red or pink eyes without any pus discharge from the eye, just a red eye, very red tongue looking like a strawberry, red lips, loss of appetite, enlarged neck lymph nodes, fever, which is very high grade, more than 100.4, lasting for two to three days, associated diarrhea or vomiting, abdominal cramping, a rash which comes in with fever and, and makes a uh, child looks really flushed uh, with red eyes, red face, red lips, red, uh, red tongue, in irritability or sluggishness. This is something very important in small infants who may not be able to communicate how they are feeling but they will stop eating, they will become extremely cranky, they will excessively cry, they won't sleep very well. Those are the issues which, we, uh, which you see. And swollen hands and feet, then you need to uh, think about the multisystem inflammatory syndrome and bring the child as early as possible to the hospital. Now, how was this kind of found out and what was the relation between COVID and this MISC? It was based on a sound research which was done initially in the UK. After the uh, COVID infection wave, they started seeing children presenting these kind of symptom complex almost one month to six weeks after the uh, COVID exposure and, and these symptoms uh, constituted uh, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome. Over the last 15 days in Aster itself, we have seen 15 children most of them had exposure to COVID in, in, in the family one month back, presenting with fever, red eyes, extreme fatigue, and neck swelling, and had uh, breathing difficulty. All except one needed ICU admission. That means these children require ICU admission for monitoring. The main thing what we are worried about in these children is affecting uh, effect, affection of the heart. Now, when this multisystem inflammatory syndrome affects the heart and the blood vessels which supply the heart, it can really, really make the heart very weak, causing breathlessness and fall in blood pressure, requiring medications both to augment the blood pressure and also the supportive immunomodulators that we start for these children known as IVIG. And this IVIG is going to switch off the dysregulated immune system and the immune cascade that has got activated because of a previous exposure to COVID almost one month to six weeks back. So these... Uh, these children require uh, ICU admission and that is why uh, they're there. So, so many of the parents will have this doubt. No, my child had COVID, he was completely fine. Now, what is this uh, post COVID and why, why is that my child become so sick? So we need to understand that the, whether you have had a minor exposure or a severe COVID illness, that does not matter. It, what matters is that if your immune system has not switched off and then it has, it has just gone onto a self-propagating cascade, reaches a peak by four to six weeks post uh, after the COVID infection and presents with these symptoms. Why it is time critical, why we need ICU for these children is primarily because it affects the heart and it makes the uh, heart very weak and all the blood vessels supplying the heart, it becomes swollen. So it, it, we have a very narrow window in which if we start the treatment right, 
most of them will do complete recovery. So most of them have recovered. However, one is on a ventilator who, who has again got extubated uh, yesterday. The second wave, are children more affected than before? Yes, they are more affected just by the large number of adults who have been affected. Children also have got affected uh, as such. But what we are facing primarily now is the post-COVID complications of MISC. So how, uh, what are the data points as such? Even in, in the adults, the second wave constituted almost 14% of the total uh, cases. Now, this is a very interesting graph, which shows that if you see the, the, uh, the data points between less than 14 years, in, in July uh, 2020, um, the, the almost 0.5% of total uh, COVID cases were less than 14 years. And this changed in the second wave uh, as such, when, when you started noticing that the number of patients less than 20 years was almost 11%. So there was 20 time rise in the number of children who got affected. Also, the change in trend was that more younger people got affected in the second wave compared to a uh, first wave where, where more of, uh, sorry, more of uh, the, the older elderly population with comorbid uh, conditions who got affected more. So younger breadwinner populations, especially the parents, uh, got affected in the second wave. And also the children definitely got affected more in the second wave. So a few thousand children with developed MISC, almost 20 lakh children uh, uh, have got affected with COVID in the second wave all over the country. And if by the logic of around 0.5%, even if we take close to 10,000 children are li likely to develop this MISC and require the ICU care in these children. Now, a lot of people uh, among you also have a doubt about this black fungus. And interestingly, almost uh, a textbook released in 2018 uh, has, has warned India about the, the epidemic of mucormycosis or the black fungus predominantly because of our unhealthy eating habits, the, the epidemic of diabetes, hypertension, and the medications that we use for that without really, really modifying our immediate lifestyle, all these things will have an effect on the increased incidence of mucormycosis. The epidemic of corona is just an incidental epidemic and that has really, really brought uh, forth this whole problem of black fungus. So, so patients who have very high blood sugars in terms of poorly controlled diabetes, who have also needed to use or have self-medicated themselves with steroids when they have got affected with COVID and a very irrational broad spectrum prolonged antibiotics along with a kind of COVID infection which has hit their immunity has caused an explosion of the incidence of black fungus. So the COVID infection will kind of destroy your inner lining of the nose, throat and, and the lungs as such. And this dead mucosa is going to get colonized with this fungus. And in a patient who has already got steroids and, and has got very high blood sugar, it will start infiltrating these tissues. And sometimes it really, really colonizes in the nose and the throat and then kind of uh, um, burrows through that soft tissue and enters into the sinuses on, of your face and into the brain. And that is why it is a seriously, significantly morbid infection requires a combination of both surgery as well as antifungal medications. So be very careful if, if you are any one of you are diabetics, any one of you have had to take a long course of steroids during the, the COVID period and have had a prolonged course of antibiotics, you are at a very high risk of acquiring this mucor, which is there all around us in the environment and sometimes can come in from, from a very unsterile, non-medical grade oxygen if you are taking it at home. So can we prevent it? Yes, we can prevent it by uh, by going on, on the strict diet and control of blood sugar using medications. No self-medications, especially that of steroids and broad spectrum antibiotics and avoid getting COVID and get yourself vaccinated as such. Avoid getting COVID by that we mean that you follow all the COVID appropriate behavior and prevent the complications of COVID from happening. Now, how do we prevent COVID-19 infection in children? It still hinges on basically good COVID appropriate behavior. That is hand, hy hand hygiene, hand wash, wearing face masks, 
following this uh, the COVID etiquette that is self quarantining when you have symptoms, avoiding crowded places, avoiding functions, gatherings, birthday parties, and marriage parties, and keeping your distance of six feet will will really really avoid you from getting this infection. We we are really really pained by the number of patients who who come in very very sick, very agitated, very anxious parents. Uh, and, and if you see all of them would have reached this COVID appropriate behavior sometime in the period of last two to three months, and then they are facing problems of their children landing up in ICU with all kinds of complications. So when it can be prevented by using simple common sense and following a, a proper COVID uh, appropriate behavior till the whole population gets vaccinated. I think as a society, we owe that responsibility to each other and also to the, to the medical fraternity, which is really, really struggling in this epidemic as such. So what is more important in preventing COVID? Is it vaccine or is it COVID appropriate behavior? The answer is both. So, so, so just make sure that whatever vaccine you get and you have access to, you really, really take it. It will, it will protect you uh, significantly against a major disease, preventing you from translating from infection to disease to ICU. And that's why that's where the benefit of vaccine is. It is not going to prevent COVID infection. It is going to prevent the serious complications of COVID. The most important, again, uh, uh, to be highlighted is a COVID appropriate behavior that all of you need to follow. So uh, one important aspect uh, which we have currently facing both with children as well as parents is, uh, is the challenge of putting them together in a lockdown scenario, in a closed house, facing each other day to day, day after day for as long as now one and a half years. So that has really, really taken toll uh, of parents because when some of you are working from home, the boundaries which exist between a home and a workplace are completely blurred. The, the daily routine has gone for a toss. Everything, work, home, family has merged into a closed space. And that's, that's kind of an exclusive scenario for, for the mental health of both child and the parents. So, so one thing which we advise parents is then that just uh, give yourself some slack. I think it's important for you to practice self-love before you really, really reach out and take care of your children uh, as well. So just take care of yourself better. So, so to take care of children effectively, we need to take care of yourself. By that, we mean eat healthy home-cooked food, plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables, adequate sleep, and adequate time away from the screens that you are so addicted to and a human to human interaction uh, between between all the members of the family is is really going to kind of keep that emotional stability um, going in in families as such reassure your child that family is your top priority anybody who's more than eight years in the family has got enough insight and intelligence to kind of absorb whatever he hears from the news channels, whatever he reads from the newspaper, and also simple conversations about COVID, about your workplaces, about the school that the child is missing right now, that something is not right. So, so, so as, as uh, head of the family, as the elders and the adults in the family, it is very important for us to keep those communication channels open and reassure the children that the family is your top priority and you will do everything within your power to take care of the family, whatever happens. Make sure that your children know when you are ready to talk. Uh, it, it is very important, for, as I told you, to have that human one-to-one -one connect and one-to-one -one conversation, not facing the device or, or, or your mobiles, but making good eye contact so that the children are able to see the emotions, experience the emotions, and are able to communicate better, and they feel listened to. Be truthful in answering their questions. It is very important for us to not be very dismissive. At the same time, not give a very false sense of hope to children about whatever is happening in the outside world. It has to be treated with caution and truth. If a teenage, uh, teenage son or a daughter asks the parents about what's going to happen to this pandemic. You cannot give false reassurance saying in another two months, everything will be all right and schools will reopen or we will go for a holiday by the time your birthday comes. So these are unrealistic and untruthful statements which you will not and, 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 and promises which you cannot keep. So, so just 
make sure that that we do not engage with such trivial talk so be truthful and make sure that children are listened to in at homes it is very important again is is basically to maintain an everyday routine because it gives a structure to to at a both an individual level and as well as at a family level so make sure that there is a routine that you wake up every day at the same time and you go to bed every day at the same time most of most of uh, the younger parents have have completely lost track of the day night routine as well as the work life routine and that itself will disturb both the inner balance the physical and the mental balance as well as the hormonal balance which will again predispose you to a lot of other medical issues as such so have an individual daily routine and have a family routine as well so that would mean uh, eating eating your meals together having time uh, to talk to each other uh, over and about the the work times that that you have uh, made for yourself have plenty of interesting thing to do it started off the pandemic gave us a lot of opportunity to get together and explore new talents uh, especially baking cooking everybody was doing that but then people have kind of thinking that they will get back to work but then again we need to reinvent all those interesting things to do at home as such so today technology gives us the access to reach out to to the extended family cousins uh grandparents all these things again have have a particular time where all of you log in and have a good time interacting with each other and sharing your days and also the joys and sorrows with each other and be role models you know we we usually tell uh parents that children don't uh, learn from you what they what you tell them to do but they always learn from you what they observe and and they they, they are kind of master imitators and that is why it is very important to understand that children never listen to you but then they 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 always are watching you and absorbing and observing you so that that is something which as parents we need to be aware and many times because of all the negativity that comes in into our homes through the news channels and that negativity gets translated into anxiety for the parents and that anxiety gets reflected on the children because they they are an easy punching bag so never do that be mindful of your language your posture and how you are behaving with your children at homes so before we kind of uh, open to questions just a, a small uh, update about the covid vaccines so so a lot of people ask whether you know the, the whether covid shield or covaxin which one to go for and unlike this donkey who is hungry and thirsty and doesn't know how to choose do not be like this get the vaccine which is easily available to you so it's like exercise you know somebody asks what is the best exercise for me it is the exercise that you do same way what is the best vaccine for you it is the vaccine which you get and which you have access to so 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 both the vaccines have been tried and tested and both of them are known to prevent uh, severe complications of covid and that has to be primarily kept in mind before all the all the kind of uh, jargon that comes out through uh, media as such in india however we we are still not we do not have vaccines for children and with our 41% of the population that's almost 50 more than 50 crore children will remain unvaccinated till till we get uh, access to uh, students vaccine and it should happen within 3 next 3 to 4 months times so this year too we don't expect the schools to reopen any time before uh, december jan or maybe even the full year till the whole population gets adequately vaccinated so children with covid are super spreaders they will uh, with and with this continued spread mainly the virus which has got its innate nature to survive and mutate uh, will there will be a new variants which will which can cause more concerns schools uh, we we are strongly advising against reopening uh, till till all the children and the teachers are vaccinated we are seeing this surge and then we discussed how how the incidence of covid has gone on in in children uh, as well so uh, the good thing is that the vaccine research were able to give us a vaccine for covid in 9 months the studies in of these vaccines in terms of safety and efficacy have already begun in children and once the data is available most of these vaccines also in a modified dose will be available to children but still we need to go through that <clears throat> research and data before it's available so dr nc is is, is a um, world renowned 
authority on, on pediatrics and infectious diseases. But her take on the vaccine is, is just that we need to be doubly sure that these vaccines are effective and do not interact with all the other vaccines that ch child children get, especially in zero to five years of age, where every year you have certain vaccines to be taken. We need to look at both the safety as well as the efficacy and the interaction with the routine vaccines that the children are getting. So the urgency for, for this discussion is primarily because of the reports of third wave and, and uh, whether it's, it's going to get, uh, and children are going to go, get more affected. It's predominantly, based on certain trend analysis as the age group of uh, severe involvement has, has started coming down from elderly to 20 to 40. The, the, by that, the extrapolation itself, we are thinking that children may get affected more severely next wave. And also because the adults uh, would have got significantly vaccinated in, uh, by the time. However, the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, who, who, has, uh, who has studied all the data and, have got, and has given the recommendations as a primary academic body uh, and whose recommendations we all follow, has told that there is a possibility of third wave, but it is difficult to predict its timing as well as the severity. Children are as susceptible as adults and older individuals to develop infection, but because of their innate nature of the uh, immunity and certain receptor profile um, um, as such, it is the infections in children are unlikely to cause severe infection and exclusively affects children as such. Severe disease occurs in children, but then the, the, it, there is no clear cut evidence to suggest that most children in, in COVID-19 uh, uh, will have a severe COVID infection in the third wave and children do not get uh, severe disease and even if it in, in small numbers it is thus very very important that as soon as the vaccine is available for children after the safety and efficacy uh, data which is available to us we progress with vaccinating our children for these uh, disease as such so you can see here this is basically the kind of waveforms of the disease incidents in various countries. Japan has had four waves. Uh, US has had three waves. They're going on to the fourth wave. Brazil has had, uh, again, multiple waves. Similarly, India, we have had two waves. The first wave, we could control well. The second wave went completely out of control. But that we are preparing well. If the third wave is not as significant, not as big, we are able to ramp up our vaccination um, um, reduce and also involve more children in the vaccination, we will be able to win that third wave as such. So good news is Indian vaccine, co-vaccine is already undergoing trials for children aged between 2 to 18 years and we should have the data in next two months. So the prepare, for the preparedness, there is uh, the state government which has set up two task force, one to augment the medical facilities available for children because children's ICU is a very specialized field and not all hospitals will be able to take care of children with severe complications of COVID or post-COVID complications. So, so we are ramping up the bed strength and the uh, augmenting the training of doctors and nurses to look after children. The Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Karnataka, has, has been preparing protocols for home, on, home management and treatment recommendations for hospitals. Hospitals like ourselves are building capacities and pediatric ICU beds uh, have been uh, kind of increased. So the message again is that it is it is good to be prepared and, and let's all prepare for the worst and let's all hope and pray for the best. So so let's let's all take care of ourselves and people around us. We have been lucky to, to be able to survive these waves as such in, in spite of Bangalore being the epicenter in the last one month. And we are slowly kind of uh, getting ahead of the curve and we should be all doing well. But then do not let your guard down do not let the children's guard down and, and we need to really, really put forth uh, the message that all of us are still at risk till all of us get vaccinated and the children to get vaccinated. And that's a good time to, to um, for in case you have any issues and any problems, we are always there to support you at Aster uh, Center for Women and Child. This is maybe a kind of second or third program we are doing with Copy Tales. And uh, so, so, so all of you are familiar with us in North Bangalore. We have another center in South Bangalore in JP Nagar and I recently started Women and Child Center uh, exclusively at Whitefield. 
So these are the details for the home isolation in case any one of you have got exposed to uh, COVID and you need a medical advice, we are always available online and you can reach out to these details uh, for the same. So thank you and, and uh, I hope we have time to take some questions from both the teachers and, and parents and, and we'll go ahead doing that. So uh, again, Dr. Sagar and Dr. Shrikanta, if, if you are alive, uh, kindly join us and, and we would like to take the questions together. Yeah, we are here. Um, are there any parents who would like to uh, ask any questions? Yeah. Uh, hello? hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, hello, sir. So I just have a doubt like that kids are not going outside. We are just kept them inside itself. They are not moving out. They are not even playing with the neighbors or uh, anywhere. They are just in home. If uh, is it possibilities that they will be causing any infections like that? If they are not even moving outside, even they are at home protectively, is there any chances? Second, I want to take that. Is there any Sorry? chances of getting infected if you are sitting at home? Is that the right question? No, actually, uh, they just play outside. They keep on washing hands and all, but. Right. Uh, the thing is, like, uh, is there any chances that uh, if they'll get infected, like any maids are coming home? Um, so, right. due to that, right. so, but even though when the maids will come, they'll be protected, they'll not be moving around them also. They'll be in rooms only when they'll come. So, but anyhow, if they are uh, having a breathing problem or something like that. Right. So, first and foremost thing is, if your children are playing with children, from uh, your neighbor's apartment or uh, your relatives who have come from uh, their houses. We do not okay. know if your relatives or your neighbors have virus. That's number one. So if yes, your sir. relatives and your uh, neighbors have had virus and they've transmitted the virus to, your, to their kids, and if your kids are intermingling with your kids, there is a very good chance of your kids carrying the virus, definitely. That is what had happened during the, the, the post first wave, a lot of people started intermingling, a lot of children started mingling in their apartment complexes, and those children would come back with a virus, even though they were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, without knowing, they would give it to their adults or give it to their uh, elderly population, and that is how we did see significant number of cases going up. That's number one. And mates, we never have gone back to their houses and seen how many are actually staying in one closed yes. space and how where are all those people working. So chances of your mate carrying the virus to your house is extremely high. Okay. That's 100%. And currently we have data to say that the virus is suspended, that is aerosol particles are suspended in air for up to six hours. Even if I cough, sneeze or even if I talk. And most okay. importantly, the initial recommendation of six meters is gone. Six feet is gone. It is 10 meters now. So if you ask me, is there a chance that they can get? Definitely they can get. The only okay. thing is uh, children getting infected is very, very unlikely because of obvious reasons. Uh, and secondly, children getting severe infection because of uh, uh, COVID, uh, because, of, because of contracting COVID, again, is also very, very unlikely. So again, just reiterating what Dr. Chetan has said. So yes, you got to protect them, but protect them as much as possible. But there are some things that is beyond us. So don't think about those things which are beyond you. Okay, so thank you. So there's one question in the chat box uh, by Mr. Rajesh, which says, what is the suggestion for healthy food which will improve their immunity? So one thing is we know for sure what is uh, not needed for, for uh, children to eat. So anything which is junk. Now, what do we mean by junk food? Junk food is something which is available in new packets and tins and which usually titillate only the taste buds, but is otherwise not good for the body. So anything which is in, which is in packet, tins, preservative rich is junk food. Please avoid that. Food which, has, which can be prepared at home is freshly sourced out of market and freshly prepared is the food which will help your child have a good immunity. 
and usually we follow uh, the advice of my five that means your plate should have equal amount of carbohydrates coming from grains like rice and wheat good amount of proteins which is basically the dals pulses uh, the the sprouted grams as well as non vegetarian food equal amount of fruits equal amount of vegetables and equal amount of dairy which is basically a, a glass of milk or a bowl of curds so this diet if followed 3 to 4 times a day for your children home based rich in fruits and vegetables is definitely the way forward avoid any form of packaged food which will definitely make you obese and this high carbohydrate um, high sugar high salt high maida uh, rich food is definitely definitely going to affect your immunity in the adverse way i have one question uh, so uh, i just got vaccinated uh, this month so what i felt after vaccination for 15 days i was feeling very weak and uh, like you know i was suggested like not to interact with lot of people in fact like you know keep yourself quarantine isolated and the effect is still there so uh, what is the call and i heard lot of cases like after vaccination lot of people are getting uh, adverse effect of that so can you please uh, yeah give some yeah. information Agar, on that uh, you want to answer that so first is that a uh, lot of people getting adverse effect is is a wrong fact uh, i don't uh, see there is only 0.5 per million so 0.5 people in 10 lakh people having adverse effect for vaccination so or means means one person out of 20 lakh vaccinated children uh, vaccinated people are getting some form of side effect is not a significantly high side effect that much side effect if 20 lakh people drive on the roads definitely the chances of getting hit by an accident is definitely much much higher so the the, the fear of vaccination which all of you have should be dismantled and i request you uh, as as kind of uh, people who have uh, who have got vaccinated those side effects which which are not disabling is has to be taken in stride and looked at so coming to the other uh, aspect of the question sagar uh, you can take over yeah i would like to reiterate the fact that vaccination is given to prevent deaths from covid so any side effect has to be compared to death so because we are seeing in this second wave significant mortality out of covid and the shortage of health facilities that was created by the surge so the need for vaccination was not even felt by the community before this wave came in this wave has shown us what is the need for vaccination and when something is compared against a severe outcome like death minor side effects have to be accepted a little pain myalgia fever is seen in most of us even i have got that for 3 days but i look up to that if i am protected against covid because of that pain i would be happy to bear that pain so again health or i would say medicine works on this principle of risk versus benefit ratio often people ask me of medicines where there is no side effect i tell them there is no medicine which has effect and no side effect so whenever there is effect there would be side effects in the same way this is an intervention that we are doing to prevent covid in the population there would be remote risk of serious side effects but then again that has to be compared to what would happen if i get covid right so that is what i would say and then i don't know why you were advised to stay at home for 15 days i don't get any logic behind that because you got vaccination and not infection so it was not that you should have been quarantined for 15 days unless you yourself had fever cough cold and symptoms of covid then it that is all together a different story otherwise just because you had myalgia there is no need to quarantine yourself for 15 days yeah so i mean uh, that's everybody tells like i mean that's what from the the influential thing and all that your immune system gets weak after the dose is that the correct thing like you know that that's what so we really need to know so for the prevention of getting covid after the vaccination is much more higher because i i i have seen a case personally in my family so one of my relative after taking the covid uh, vaccination 25 days after that uh, he got uh, corona and he was on 95% of oxygen level for one month one month and one week now he is home so that was the case and that actually you know uh, took us back uh, with this thing like the vaccination thing. 
So the problem with uh, misinformation on the internet is it spreads six times faster than information. And that is the unfortunate reality that we are living today. That even as doctors, sometimes when we read newspapers, we have to think at least for a week, we keep thinking whether this information is right or wrong because there is another news that is waiting to come saying that the first news was wrong. So let us not spread panic. Okay. Second thing is uh, there is no reason that a person who has got vaccination cannot get COVID infection. Okay. Because the vaccination will pro provide immunity, especially after 15 days, some degree of immunity against COVID starts arising. But it is not a 100% guarantee that you will not get an infection. That is why even after vaccination, we have to follow the COVID appropriate behavior. What it is definitely protecting you and us is against a severe disease. Now, the third thing was after vaccination, the immunity goes low is absolutely a myth. There was another myth that was circulated that uh, women who are during their menstrual phase should not get vaccination, their immunity is low. That was another Simply, I should not say, but I should say that is nonsense. So it is very unfortunate that common man, when he's seeking for good information, a lot of uh, nonsensical information is being spread across the community, which we should defer. There is no reason that anybody's immunity goes low after a vaccination. But, but yes, after a vaccination, you are not immediately protected. And hence, the COVID appropriate behavior has to continue. So there is another question which uh, uh, in the same line, Sagar, if you can uh, take basically what is the kind of current update on pediatric vaccines? So, uh, yeah. So the first question is, should children be vaccinated? Yes, children should be vaccinated because we want children, even if only a small number of children get infected. And it is a practical issue because we have a large population of children in our country. And if they are not vaccinated, naturally, uh, if they carry the virus, the infections are going to spread. So yes, children should be vaccinated. But the current status, you would see uh, in the Western countries, already vaccinations has been recommended above the age of 12 because they have the data ready for uh, children to be vaccinated. In our country, as you must be aware, that Covaxin is uh, uh, studying the vaccination under trials. At several centers in India, children have been, now been actively enrolled. And I believe in the next few months, we should have the first vaccine out for children, but we should wait until we get enough safety data for children. And I believe by the end of this year, at least we believe that vaccination for children would be available. So Shrikanta, you want to answer the next question saying that when can a person take vaccination post recovering from COVID? Right. So this is, uh, see if I go by Government of India data, so that has been changed three times until now. Initially, uh, Government of India had stated you can take it 15 days after. Then it was one month after. Now it is currently three months after. So that th this is the current Government of India recommendation. So that is probably because of obvious reasons that we all know, because of vaccine shortages. But one month post-COVID is a reasonably good time for anybody who wants to take a vaccine, who has a hand on vaccine, to please take it. So one month is reasonably good. Sure, thank you. So uh, one, uh, 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 doc, uh, how do I take care of my four month old baby apart from keeping him away from people? I think, see, as, as a uh, family, we understand that uh, many times if there are not many caretakers or to share the household work in the absence of maids, you have a small baby at home and then you want to prevent uh, exposing them to outside environment and to people who can give the child COVID. The only way is stay home, stay safe. And if, if there are visitors at home, kindly do not allow them to come home with small babies there because the babies are at more risk for infection. Do not go to crowded places with a small baby because babies, we cannot put masks uh, as such. And if you get exposed to a person with COVID or you acquire a COVID infection, it is very important to take care of the child not isolate yourself as such, but continue to take care of the child, but you yourself wash hands, uh, use hand sanitizers and wear mask at all times, even while breastfeeding the baby. So that is the only precautions that you can take and, and hope, for, hope that the baby does not develop a severe COVID infection. So Sagar, uh, next question from uh, Mr. Vaiga is, if everyone is vaccinated at home and still one gets infected, 
will it reduce the spreading to the kids at home so they are they are talking about transmission uh, uh, and carrying the virus and transmitting it to other people even after this, uh, vaccination no so first thing is since children are not vaccinated anybody who gets an infection at home is likely to spread it to the children if children are exposed compared to the first wave it is very clear in the second wave that because as dr chetan rightly mentioned that the infectivity of this virus strain is much higher and that is why children have, have got infected in the second wave so even if you are vaccinated and somebody gets the infection there is a very good reason that this person can spread infection to children because they are not vaccinated and even others who are got, who have got vaccinated can get infected because the protection is said to be say anywhere between 60 to 80% and that too what they are offering is more than 95% protection against severe disease and 60 to 80% protection against an infection so that is still a good proportion wherein you can get infected and that is why if you have somebody infected at home and you are vaccinated all the standard precautions still apply good so one more relevant question in the same line uh, once you get vaccinated as a lactating mother uh, does the vaccination to the mother provide additional benefit to the baby in terms of transfer of antibodies in some way yeah yeah definitely if you produce antibodies some of these antibodies are going to get transferred to your baby and it is going to provide some benefit to your baby but if you ask me what degree of benefit we don't have that data like just because you are vaccinated in your breastfeeding if that baby gets exposed post to a covid positive person the baby can still get infected but if you ask me is there some degree of protection yes scientifically some antibodies would cross and through the breast milk and the baby will get some degree of protection and that is why we are advising to continue breastfeeding and shikanta will you be able to answer this lissy uh, want to know about the influenza vaccine which has been promoted uh, of late in the last two weeks there has been a lot of Uh, newspaper articles about uh, what is the logic of giving flu vaccine is it related to the pandemic or is it a general advice so uh, it so it's a it's a general advice so come monsoon we start seeing significant drop in temperatures and that is followed by uh, 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 winters in bangalore where we definitely see significant drop in temperatures with drop in temperatures we do have seasonal influenza and this seasonal influenza changes every year so last year what virus we had circulating in bangalore will not be the same virus circulating this year so if you have a virus which is the endemic in your state or in your place the chances of your child getting influenza is also on the higher side number one second covid infectivity is only 0.1% whereas influenza infectivity is 1% so in children getting infected by influenza and having significant morbidity as well as mortality because of influenza is significantly higher compared to covid so for children who have comorbidities that is children who have heart diseases children who have respiratory diseases children who have other kind of comorbidities like obesity definitely need to take a influenza vaccine the reason being where it, when you have a vaccine preventable disease it is better to prevent the child from having a uh, disease and anything and everything in this season is going to be labeled as covid until unless proven otherwise so protect your children for diseases which already have vaccine in existence which have been proven to be excellent in their efficacy as well as uh, uh, as well as their uh, immunogenicity and most importantly safety record and the third most important point i want to make here is influenza between 6 months to 6 years is something that is recommended by indian academy of pediatrics for every children irrespective of having comorbidities and more than 6 years children who have comorbidities we definitely ask them to take influenza vaccine so there is no special recommendation but it is a general recommendation for uh, not only this season but for any season to come thank you shikanta and in the same as an extension of that question uh, sagar do uh, what do you recommend with respect to uh, how do we go about the routine vaccination say a child who is less than 2 years he will have a lot of vaccinations coming in so how do we do it do we delay it uh, or do we go ahead and take it on time so see with the beginning of pandemic last year when we started having the pandemic nobody actually knew how long this could stretch 
now we are already into the second year and we are also talking about the third wave and so on so i'm sure this is a long lasting problem and there is no reason we should delay vaccination in children because as dr srikant already highlighted there is one enemy which we are fighting and we don't know clearly how to fight it but there are different there are other enemies where we have already have vaccines so why not protect our children from what we already have so the vaccination there is no reason to delay children especially below the age of 1 those are very very important vaccines should get regular shots and i'm sure these days pediatricians are also kind of prepared wherein they have the vaccination clinic separately and the flu clinics are very separate so those slots are different those timings are different and they space them out so that those children who go to get vaccination shots are uh, not exposed to the risk of covid so please go ahead and get vaccinated and make sure that you get vaccinated wherein the risk is minimum that is what i would recommend uh doctor i have uh, two questions actually i wanted to ask for uh, children that you said who have had covid in the past uh, they can uh, develop uh, after a month they can get the mi uh, uh, i don't know yeah so um how do you i mean how do you know if it was asymptomatic if it was symptomatic how do you uh no uh, how do you calculate from the last day of them recovering uh, from covid uh, one month after that to look out for these signs or from the from the day they got they contracted covid how do you figure that out so uh, i'll take that up yeah yeah so one thing is uh, see that is one thing we told so the parents are aware there is no fixed time like it should be four weeks after covid no it is anywhere between 2 to 8 weeks after exposure to covid that we are seeing children who are coming back with these signs and symptoms so there are two group of children here one wherein the family had covid or the child had covid so we can say for the next two months be observant if you develop fever i mean to say if the child develops fever has got red blood shot eyes has got rashes on the body has got severe pain abdomen don't wait any of these symptoms please report to your doctor now if otherwise also in this season a child develops high fever and these signs we would still think about this disease because many of them may have had an exposure and they don't know we have had a few cases wherein when we asked did you have an exposure to covid the parents deny but the covid antibody test is positive and all the standard signs which i described are available mm -hmm. so for those who have recovered they can be on watch out for these signs but even if you don't have an exposure to covid whatever signs did that we discussed if those are present these days doctors are well aware that this syndrome has to be looked for and must be treated okay uh, the next question is if in case somebody has had in the in the house they have had covid uh, and it's mild or it's asymptomatic uh, is it uh, a, a mandate that when you get covid your lungs or your uh, whatever are uh, infected or do get affected in the long run Uh, if they haven't showed any symptoms of breathlessness or low uh, oxygen level, if it's a mild case, to my mind again, I'm sure Dr. Shrikant will answer. But to my mind, if you have had a mild illness and you have recovered, there should not be any good reason to believe that in a large majority there should not be any long-standing lung issues. The lung issues definitely have been seen in those adult patients who have had requirement of oxygen and ventilation. Definitely, there is a good proportion of patients who are needing long. a few weeks of oxygen and i am sure those are the people who are going to have little bit of morbidity in the long run but those who have recovered completely within the first week without needing oxygen i don't think there is a there is a there is a reason to worry about long standing lung issues but frequent i cannot i think it's the same patients who have had significant morbidity in terms of hospitalization requiring oxygen requiring ventilatory supports bipaps have been on oxygen even after discharge those are the patients who will require prolonged uh, uh, kind of support in terms of not only the lungs issues but also overall lung, uh, covid care so that is the reason why a lot of institutes have started uh, uh, having this post covid care centers where they are only looking at post covid symptoms not, not only lung symptoms it is myalgia a lot of people are coming with complaining with, with myalgia is coming with myalgia so yes definitely a suspect of patients will require that post covid care centers but majority that is 85 to 90% who do have only asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic 
will not require anything just for just uh, just except for observation nothing else so it is a myth that you uh, by default your lungs get affected no no, no, no. it's definitely okay. a myth okay In fact, that is why we keep saying that less than 20% need hospitalization that that simply means that 80% recover and the problem has been the huge number had this been in a small number then that 20% wouldn't really bother but when it happens in this proportion that 20% becomes a very very big number uh -huh. got it all right thank you doctor so if uh, uh, there are no further questions uh, uh, nisha is it is it okay to because i think both uh, all of us have to go back to our clinics now sure absolutely doctor yes yes i don't think there are any further questions anybody who would like to ask i think all our questions have been addressed uh, yeah all right i think that's it doctor thank you so much thank you so much doctor for uh, addressing all our questions i think it's made it a lot more clearer uh, for all of us so and we'll be able to use this information in the future yeah thank you thank you once again and thank you uh, look forward to uh, more collaborations uh, of the similar kind stay sure. safe and stay stay indoors still the battle is not won i think it just one more year of patience please and stay uh, and keep yourself and your family safe thank you so much thank you all. thank you doctor thank you thank you doctor yeah mm -hmm.